Uh, David Challoner. Well, I, I, I remain troubled uh, by <laughs> the fact <laughs> that 40 to 50 percent of what the commissioner of the FDA has to consider, in this case her uh, staff, is funded uh, by the industries that she is supposedly regulating. That's got to fit into her equations somewhere. Uh, one of the other interesting things. But it, it, how, how would that play to our seriously? How would that play to our motion? Does that make for an FTA that is less cautious by yeah. design than you would want it to be? No. It, to me, it still means that we have to make sure the FDA is as cautious as it is and and continues to be. I'll tell you, it's you never think about it. I mean, I worked in the agency for a number of years, and the fact that the agency was partially funded through user fees, it's effectively become a tax. It's not a user fee anymore. The industry knows they're going to have to pay it. They're not going to be able to withdraw it. It's not even a thought. Sir. And after yes. this, I think we have what, time for one more question. Yeah. Yes, David, I'm an oncologist. But my, my question really is for Dr. Huber. Dr. Godley makes the point that for polycystic, and there's so many other diseases that the, the uh, farm, farm, big pharma will not finance, they will not put money into it to develop drugs for much needed diseases because it won't make money for them. And the FDA by, I don't want to say, sh by long cutting, by making these 10 years worth of data through all these different phases, will, will make it impractical for many diseases to be looked at by the big pharma. David, uh, Jerry Avorn. It is an important question as to when you can use a surrogate measure of the kind that was discussed for polycystic kidneys or other conditions and when you have to wait for a clinical outcome. But it's not the case that FDA doesn't look at surrogate measures. In fact, it, it does all the time. In order to speed drug review, they have something called the Critical Path Initiative, which is designed to figure out when can you use a surrogate measure and when do you have to wait for a clinical event. But there is a downside to surrogate measures we can't forget about. A surrogate measure used to approve diabetes drugs was, was whether your blood sugar goes down. Most of us thought that was a great idea until it turned out that Avandia lowers your blood sugar and causes heart attacks. And so it's a, an important balance to know when is it okay to use a surrogate measure and when isn't it. It's not always okay and we just need to get more thoughtful and, and astute about that. Sir? Front row. Hi, my name is Edgar. Um, I think a rec relatively recent case was the drug of uh, Avastin, and it was a drug that was unanim unanimously declined by FDA, and yet there were a few patients that showed great promise. I mean, they really responded well to this, and yet under the old paradigm of chasing p-values, a statistical term, it just was uh, disregarded. So is it, could it be the case that the low-hanging fruits that fit the old model of statistics are done with, and that maybe we should be looking at newer models? I mean, computation power is basically free now. Why not move in a new direction? Do, and do you feel that you hear them? But just for clarity, do you, do you feel that you hear this side saying they don't want to move in any new directions? I, I feel like this side is saying keep the status quo. OK. No. To be clear, I don't think we're saying that. I think we're, yeah. we're saying both in, in the sure, case yeah, of Dr. Right. Challoner and the approval of devices, and in my case, in the approval of drugs, there's a lot of, of exciting possibilities for looking at genetics, for looking at molecular markers. We're totally in favor of that. And I think that one of the most important misstatements made by the other side is that FDA doesn't want to look at this and doesn't care. FDA very much is trying to look at this. They just want to get the science right. So it's a myth that FDA is so, not willing to consider. So Jerry, what is it that you want to hold on to that you think they want to get rid of? I want to hold on to a um, careful view of the science because to, to not get too statistically wonky, I think uh, it's, it's pretty clear that if you just give you know, a sugar pill or garlic or anything to a bunch of people with cancer, there will be people who get better because sometimes people's cancers get better no matter what. And what is at risk here is the idea that that tail of the curve that may have nothing whatever to do with the substance, because we see it with placebo, someone's going to say, aha, that's the subgroup that needed to have this drug. Mm. Even though there's no molecular basis for believing that, there's always going to be some people who get better from a bad disease with placebo because that's the but way let diseases me, let me are. Let me repeat my question because I kind of lost it. What, what is it you say that you want to hold on to that they want to get rid of? 
I want to hold on to having a high standard for when a biomarker or a surrogate measure or another assessment of a drug um, is accepted as really being scientifically true. And you think that they're not, not... Well, I think the fallacy in the other side's argument is that there's always going to be people who get better no matter what you do. And if you attribute that to a drug, you're going to approve a lot of drugs that not only aren't helping people, because okay. those same people... Uh, no, there hasn't been Scott any Gottlieb. cancers that and cured on their dangerous. own, but... But you know, I think the, the issues about caution and risk and embracing these new kinds of technologies takes a certain degree of risk and it takes people at the agency outside their comfort zone. And what I think we're arguing is that the agency is just not willing to embrace the risk. They're, they're wedded to a very old model of doing things and they haven't moved outside the comfort zone. Sure, they have pilot programs. I started the Critical Path Initiative with Dr. McClellan, um, but they haven't progressed because ultimately the leadership can talk about these ideas and does, but when it filters down to the review level, the reviewers ultimately feel uncomfortable moving outside the established models and taking the risk that it would take to adopt those kinds of innovations. So it's the cultural thing you mentioned okay, earlier. Can I, can you can change the culture, but you have to change the structure of the process. Could I add one, one I'll let Peter, let Peter say something, then you, and then we're going to wrap. In the, pre, in, the pre, in the White House report that I mentioned, they describe the uh, IT systems inside the FDA. They, they, they are woefully inadequate. They are, they're, the systems don't connect among offices, OK? They have incompatible protocols, and they are still resorting to entering data manually. Now, I don't blame this on any individual at the FDA, but that's what happens to large bureaucratic structures Washington. They are an information industry, and they can't, uh, you know, they're working uh, with clay tablets and donkeys, really. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Avorn. I Jerry Avorn. I completely agree. As one of the authors of that presidential report, I totally endorse what you said. One of the difficulties FDA has is that folks who are intent on reducing the size of big government and taking away the budgets that government agencies have some of whom may be on the stage, that make it impossible <laughs> make it impossible for an agency like that to move into the, forget about the 21st, into the late 20th century because they don't have the budget. You need to be able to fund governmental entities to do the work that they need to do, not just say the marketplace will take care of it, and that's part of FDA's problem. That, that, um... And that concludes round two of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate where our motion is the FDA's caution is hazardous to our health. Now we move on to round three. These will be short closing statements from each debater in turn. They will be two minutes each. Speaking first, to summarize his position against the motion, the FDA's caution is hazardous to our health, Jerry Avorn. He is a professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School. Ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Avorn. <laughs> We've heard thalidomide mentioned a couple of times tonight, and I think that may be a good thing to, to remember as, as you vote and as you think about whether the FDA is too cautious or not. Before the thalidomide debacle, there were some amendments in Washington that Senator Kefauver had put forward saying that in 1962, the agency ought to have the right to, demonstrate, to make a manufacturer show that their drugs actually worked. That was not a requirement in 1961. That was something which was being um, debated in the Senate, and by all accounts, the Kefauver amendments were going to go down in flames because we had people saying, oh, we can't let big government get between the doctor and the patient. We can't restrict the liberty of Americans to take whatever they want. We can't have doctors' hands tied by having this government agency saying whether or not a drug is allowed to be sold for a given purpose. Right before the amendment went down in flames, it turned out that there were women who had children being born all over Europe, Japan, um, Africa, with little deformities, and many of you have seen these pictures, um, instead of arms and legs. They had little flippers, as well as a lot of internal organ damage. And that was because a company was making a drug called thalidomide, called a lot of other things in other countries, as a sedative and anti-nauseant um, that was particularly marketed aggressively to pregnant women. Um, and there was a reviewer in the FDA named Dr. Frances Kelsey. It was her first task to review this drug. She's still alive in her 90s, living in Washington. And she said, no, I don't think there's enough safety information. We don't need another sedative or anti-nauseant for pregnant women. And almost single-handedly, she caused the drug to not be available or to deny it to the American public. As a result, thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of American kids were not born with these anomalies. That changed around the legislation, FDA was given the power in the wake of the thalidomide crisis to say, yeah, you got to show that your drug is safe and effective before we're going to let you sell it. I don't think we want to go back to a pre-thalidomide era by weakening the FDA. Thank you, Jerry Avorn.
Our motion is the FDA's caution is hazardous to our health. And here to summarize his position.